uh, were using Arab issues and Arab cards to defend the uh, nuclear uh, file because they wanted to show the West that they can affect Western interests in Arab countries. That was the assumption then. But with the nuclear deal, it is very strange that they continue behaving in a manner Never, never in the uh, world of Islam did we witness that kind of confrontation that we witness today because of the employment of religion to serve national policies, political objectives. The issue is you use religion as an instrument of politics. And that should not be. That should not be. I'm completely right. Can I, can I just say, I, I, I agree totally uh, with Abel. You've, you've put your finger on the, on the whole problem. There are politicians who are twisting and abusing religion and, uh, and, and different strains of the same religion in order to further their, their own political objectives. And that's one of the biggest problems in the whole, political problems in the whole region. And uh, the tragedy for me, and that's why you have these proxy wars being fought the whole time in that area, is that there's not strong enough <laughs> who are willing to reach out beyond their Sunni or Shia or whatever group to the other side and bring people together and to, and to develop a, na a, a, national, a national story again. A national story. That's what's lacking. And that's the tragedy. And uh, I, I've just come from Cyprus where I've seen one example of how this can happen. And it's not there yet. And it's still very difficult. But you've got two leaders from the Greek community and the Turkish community who are trying, and they're taking risks. They're taking risks, each is taking risks with his own community to try to bring that island together. And I see that in Cyprus, and I have to tell you, I don't see it anywhere else in the region. And that's why you've got international, you've got the, the Saudis, the Iran, everybody moving in and, and puppeteering and playing proxy wars. And it's a, it's a tragedy to watch it. We need to, have a, we need to have some way of encouraging visionary leadership in that area. People who can tell a story that brings people together from different factions and different religious groups into one nation. That's what's missing. Perhaps our experience with, uh, with the Helsinki process, as, as Paolo indicated earlier, might offer some... some I wouldn't say um, formats, but some thoughts on how you could do this, because the same problem was Europe's problem in the 1970s. How can you provide security to nations who until now believe they need to subjugate other nations to be safe? And this is the problem, of course, now across the Mediterranean, where Iran thinks it needs to subjugate other nations for its own security. Turkey has sometimes the same impulse, Saudi Arabia the same. Uh, you don't solve this by just saying you shouldn't do that. You only solve this if you have a keen eye on which security issues specifically need to be addressed to uh, create a different situation of not wanting to subjugate other nations. And in that context, I strongly believe that the nuclear deal with Iran should be something we should maintain at all cost because yeah. it would exacerbate the problem rather than solve the problem if we would come back uh, uh, to that. But we also need to look at other elements like we did in Helsinki of economic investment, the human dimension that could 
perhaps alleviate some of the fears uh, some countries have uh, uh, because of the instability uh, in their neighborhoods. So the, the age-old problem of wanting sort of an area under your regard, chasse garde, because that is necessary for your security, is still there. Uh, sadly, also in Europe, if you see the behavior of the Russian Federation, which is exactly the same. So this needs careful diplomatic attention in the broadest possible way, and Europe should be part of that also in the wider Mediterranean. You see, my, my problem with this Helsinki approach is that if the concept of Helsinki has been offered to Europeans in 1945 or 1950, no one would have grasped yes, the, the logic. Point. Very good the point. logic. Yes. The Middle East and the East Mediterranean yes. and Southern Mediterranean in the, is in the midst of a war of, of people killing each other and you don't know why they are killing each other. Absolutely so right. have have your priorities laid down proper. Yes. I, in all honesty, feel that priority one is defeating Daesh, ISIS, ISIL, and terrorism. Defeat them. They will stay with us for years, if not decades. Do not deceit yourself. They will be defeated militarily as armies, but they will stay as ideology and as dormant cells or small cells that are ready to strike anywhere and everywhere. So defeat them first. Then try to reconcile differences inside societies. And that will entail lots of economic effort and lots of education. Without economic and education, forget it, because the war will continue and continue to eternally. Look for a Westphalian peace, whereby the national state is, is reborn, and peace and security and economic revival is is in short. But do not jump to conclusions by saying we will pursue uh, Helsinki today. The conditions are not available today. I, I think it is a very fair comment and I s subscribe to it completely, but the world also moves much faster than it did 30, 40 years ago. So opportunities will arise much faster and we need to be ready to take them once we, we see them. And let me just make one comment from a country where we've seen, from my country, also the Netherlands, foreign fighters go to Syria to join Daesh. And one, one wonders, from a society which, which one could call pretty rich, that we have not been able to inspire part of our younger generation yeah. to be part of our society. And they feel inspired by a murderous nihilist ideology and even want to give their lives for that murderous nihilist ideology. Something has gone wrong in our societies as well that this is happening. So in that sense, fighting Daesh also means you need to fight the recruitment grounds for Daesh. And this comes with giving opportunity, fighting discrimination, uh, improving uh, our educational systems, uh, an inclusive society. So in that sense, you know, fighting Daesh is not just a military operation, it's also an ideological, I would say, operation in your societies just as much as in ours. And that, we're in the same boat as far as that's concerned. You know, uh, the president of Egypt is insisting in modernizing Islam. And he lectures all the time of the need of how to allow Islam and Muslims to embrace modernity. I keep telling my uh, European uh, friends, in France, give us a thousand scholarships a year for Egyptian sheikhs and mullah to join Sirbon. And in Holland, 
and in Cambridge and in Oxford. If you allow thousands of mullahs joining European universities, receiving opening on the West, that hatred to the West might not continue. It will change. It will change. So the important thing is to exchange, to build okay. bridges. I agree. I agree. A thousand mullahs. A thousand mullahs, yes. A, 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 enrolled at Oxford and Cambridge. Why not? Why not? Okay, well, will you fund it? No, that is the problem. I do not have the resources to fund them. I'm sure someone in this audience could, <laughs> could, could, could help out. Mind That's, you. That, 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 all, but, but look, it's a, good, it's a good idea. All, all the sheikhs of Egypt who over the 19th century and 20th century were instrumental in Egyptian modernity learned the sciences in the West. Yes. So open up for them. Yeah, and, all, and Oxford and Cambridge would not have existed in their current form if it had not been for Averroes and Avicenna and all the, the, the Muslim right. scholars who preserved F Aristotle. Fully agree with yes, that. Yes, and you thought you'd like that point. And it's true. <laughs> uh, it, it's true. But, but uh, you know, I, we do what we can. We have the evening program, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, there may be some evening scholars here. We try to get as many international students uh, as we can. One in seven, uh, Abu, one in seven of the kings and queens and presidents and prime ministers in the world today were educated in our country, I'm proud to say. Uh, obviously, you want to increase and my son that. Too. And, and your son, and, and, and everybody is welcome, by the way, uh, prov you know, provided they pay the fees uh, and, all, and, all, and all the rest of it. Uh, we want to be open to, to talent. Uh, we, want, we want to do that, and I think it's a, it's a very good idea. But, but just going back to, to, to France's point, you know, they were all guilty. Thing, the Heinz kiosk, as we used to say, the, the idea that uh, there are also, let's face it, there are also middle class jihadis. Yes, absolutely. there are many. There are yes. many doctors. Yes, uh, people have, uh, from respectable professions uh, who go off to, uh, to to join Daesh, and we have to think what's going on in their heads yes, too. And it's a, it's a very very complex issue, and I think it's important that we are defeating Daesh on the ground. They, they, they have had a huge reduction of their territory, both a 40% reduction of their territory in Iraq, 20% reduction in, in Syria. We are making progress, folks. We shouldn't be too... Uh, and, and, and Italy, as I said earlier on, has played a, a leading role in that. Well, it's, it's also important to note that, you know, uh, the education part of, of, of clerics and, and mullahs is very important, but that's really dealing with sort of the supply side of knowledge. But ultimately, uh, there has to be a social base for uh, moderation, which means you have to have a prosperous uh, middle class uh, that, that actually uh, benefits from trade. And Just before turning to the audience, uh, um, you know, we talked a lot about Helsinki, but some of the points that Ahmed raised uh, are, are interesting in the sense that, so we're looking at the Middle East, maybe another sort of pa historical parallel is the 30-year war, and you referred also to peace of Westphalia. So, so, you know, the Arab world, as you said, has been going through a period of destruction, two of its uh, largest uh, mostly historically most important countries, Iraq and uh, uh, Syria, lost control of large parts of their territory uh, in civil war. Egypt, the third most important of the, of, the, of the top three, has gone through a great deal of internal tumult. And at the same time, the other two neighbors in the region, now obviously Israel included, that situation hasn't changed. Iran and Turkey have come out of this crisis without any internal disturbance that has really weakened their, their position. So should we really actually be talking about a new regional order uh, that would address uh, 
some of the issues you raised. Now, what's the nature of a peace, fail, a peace of or Congress of Vienna or a peace of Westphalia deal in the Middle East? And secondly, who's going to convene it? I mean, clearly, these countries are not talking to each other. Iran and Saudi Arabia are actually not talking at all. Uh, whether the Arab League is the right uh, um, uh, place to start the conversation. I mean, some of the issues that you raised, that if you were to go to Ankara and Tehran and put these on the table, whether it's the European Union as an outside balancer, uh, as an as a, uh, as a interested party in the fate of the Mediterranean, which is the theme of this conference, should take it upon itself to convene that sort of grand conference of Congress of Vienna type of a situation to, to, to be, build the rules of the game, negotiate state building. Very, I think it's very interesting. Valley. Forget it. <laughs> Why is it to forget it? I have um, a certain logic. You have the Arab world and the Arab League is the embodiment of the Arab world. That is the core of the Middle East. Okay. Then you have the neighbors. The neighbors are between three to four. You have Iran, you have Turkey. Do not yeah. please forego Israel because it is in the center and occupying the principal issue of the Arab world, occupying Palestinian territory. Then you have the force, possibly and possibly not, uh, uh, Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Possibly and possibly not. So you have the outer core, which is Iran, Turkey, Israel. Iran and Israel will never talk for the foreseeable future. Iran and Turkey are in competition all the time, silent, but very severe competition. And then you have that uh, uh, pressure of let's expand in the vacuum areas. The vacuum areas are sadly today El Mashraq, a place was the core of the Arab League, no more to be found. So you need first to reorganize your order to build potential. Again, I insist, defeat Daesh, defeat terrorism. And then from there we see. But you offer the Arab world into uh, a contract with the region, it is uh, a weak Arab world, and they will never accept to I was in Sir Benyas last week in Emirates. And the problem is the Iranians are making offers to Gulf, but telling them your strategic depth should not be participating. The strategic depth, I mean a place like Egypt and a place like Jordan. That is the strategic depth of Saudi Arabia and Gulf. You cannot tackle them alone. You have to take them as a block. But they are not yet ready. But just very specifically on, on a number of issues, where you, you raised the issue of the European Union. What could the European Union do? I think the, the, one of the small advantages we have as European Union, we are not intimately linked to one of the parties uh, in the proxy wars. Um, so in that sense, we, we are not seen as a uh, sponsor of one or the other as much as o other outside powers like the United States and, and Russia are. So that gives us a slightly more uh, um, balanced uh, uh, position, I would argue. Secondly, we urgently need to come up, yes we need to fight Daesh, but we urgently need to come up with a comprehensive plan for the future of Syria, because if we don't do that, um, uh, you know, all, all the other stuff is not going to work either, if the bloodshed and barbarism doesn't stop in Syria, and that, to do that, you need these outside powers, you, you need to go yes, beyond yes, the yes. countries you mentioned absolutely. before. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, but I think, I think France, maybe, maybe you're, you know, maybe we're being a bit too, too negative about this, maybe, maybe, 
there is scope for some kind of much bigger conversation about all these, these conflicts where you see so often the same actors, the same proxy actors, or the same uh, puppeteers, if you like, uh, having a hand in what is going on. And you can't help but wonder if you've got everybody around the table and you tried to create some sort of sense of, of what the grand bargain could be and where one side could give ground and another side could accept some, maybe you could make some progress. But at the moment, I think it is, it is absolutely shambolic. And the, I, I, you know, I, I totally agree about doing, getting rid of Daesh first. You've got to get rid of Daesh. But then that doesn't solve the problem. So I'm told we have a little bit of time to um, have questions from the audience. Uh, if you, yes, this gentleman here. And if you wait for the microphone. Thank you. I am the Deputy Foreign Minister of Turkey. So I spent almost all my diplomatic life in Middle East, in Arab countries, including Mosul, Iraq, as Consul General in the different, in the very dangerous times, 2011-12. I agree with, uh, that uh, we should counter sectarianism. This is a disaster for the Middle East, for Muslim countries. But Turkish positions here are uh, mischaracterized by two speakers, you and you. Turkey is not rival to Arab states. We, and we can talk, we talk every country in the Arab world and in Iran. Certainly there are disagreements, but criticizing a brutal regime in Syria or a military coup in a friendly country, this is not intervention in, military, in, in, uh, in internal affairs. I really don't uh, respect that someone who is not bordered to Iraq they cannot understand our position. We face the consequences of crisis in Iraq for four decades. We pay huge prices, but whenever Iraqi friends need assistance, we go there. Now, we have 600 Turkish troops there, 600. Until now, they did train local people from Mosul to fight the Ash and just protected themselves. This presence is not the reason for any problem in Iraq, sir. It is the result of wrong policies in Iraq that are directly affecting us, including sectarianism. I will talk about these issues tomorrow in the sessions, but we are a peace-loving country. We know well-established rules of international relations. We respect it, but we are bordered to Syria and Iraq we have to take our measures to counter threats to our national security. And unfortunately, we pay the prices of, uh, price for mistakes of, of our nations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I wish uh, to make a comment and a question at the same time. My comment would be, I think I'm coming from Iran. The problem we have in our part of the world is we have not yet fully grasped the consequences of the nation state. The problem is uh, we have not, we do not have a theory within Islam which justifies the nation state. That's why every, uh, every other and then someone will rise up and talk in the name of Islam or in the name of Arabs or in the name of Iranians or Turks or whatever. That's a problem. And I think we have to articulate a theory within Islam which justifies the nation state. Otherwise, for instance, uh, for instance, you justify your inter in the intervention of Saudi Arabia in Yemen because that's an Arab country. We justify at the same, with the same reason to, to interfere in the affairs of another country in the name of Islam, and another country would justify it in the name of uh, neo osmanism or whatever. I think they are all wrong, and we should be clear about that. We do not recognize these extra 
extra nation state concepts because we have been hostage to such a kind of conceptualization and we are all better off uh, if, we, if we agree with the, and stick to the idea of the nation state. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what I want to say in, in response to what you, you said, sir, uh, we talked earlier about the Westphalian peace um, and in political theory...